Uh, Muhammad says during the last days, so he's not talking about during his time, he's talking about far in the future. During the last days there will appear uh, young foolish people who will say the best words, but their faith will not go beyond their throats. And they will go out from their religion as an arrow goes out of the game. So wherever you find them, kill them. For whoever kills them shall have reward on the day of resurrection. So Muhammad's not saying here in this time we're going to kill apostates, but later on, no. He's saying even far in the future, when you see people leaving Islam, you have to kill them. So here's what you have. Uh, according to all of your Muslim sources, apostates are to be killed. According to all four of the rightly guided caliphs, even when Arabia was firmly established as a Muslim community, they were still killing apostates. And Muhammad commanded his followers to uh, follow the path of the rightly guided caliphs. So Muhammad commanded apostates are to be killed. All four of the rightly guided caliphs commanded apostates to be killed. All four schools of Islamic jurisprudence commanded that apostates should be killed. Who says that apostates shouldn't be killed? modern westernized muslims who've been influenced by western values such as freedom of religion and uh, i hate to break this to you but western values is not a source of sharia law the source of sharia law quran hadith interpreted interpreted through the four schools and those sources are unanimous that apostates are to be killed so i hope that answers your question geller on air with us welcome to the show uh, sister pam pam is from uh, atlas shrugs so welcome to the show Pamela, you've uh, you've been uh, one of Rifka's uh, biggest supporters over the past couple months, if not her, if not her, her biggest supporter. Uh, you, you're, you're obviously a, a very conservative fundamentalist Christian, right? No, I'm a Jewish girl from New York, but I don't even see myself as a supporter. I really just see myself as the only member in the media, or in my case, the alternative media, that is that is. Uh, covering the story in a responsible faction, faction, responsible faction. They have no clue as to the true nature of apostasy in Islam. I just might interject one thing regarding that caller when he describes the violent text in the Bible. Just a quick aside, that, uh, a comment that Robert Spencer made that, you know, throughout history, these texts have never been taken as divine commands that either must be uh, or may be put into practice by believers in a new age. All of the passages in the Bible are uh, descriptive, not prescriptive. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. Nowhere do they command believers to, to imitate the behavior or to believe under any circumstances that God wishes them to act as his instruments of judgment in any situation today. Oh, thank you very much, Mrs. Jewish Lady, for coming in here and explaining for David Wood his Bible, because I'm pretty sure he doesn't know his Bible. I really like that. Prescriptive, or descriptive, but not prescriptive. The Bible is not prescriptive. God's words are not prescriptive. Pretty interesting. Well, I'll show you how clear it is in the Bible, the command to kill apostates. Again, I will put this, I put this in the first video, I'm going to put this here. And then I'm going to have your president, your own president, if, if uh, you don't believe what I'm writing here or you don't want to refer to it yourself, I'll have your own president, Mr. Obama, refer to it, and I'm pretty sure he's pretty liable. Here's the verses from the Bible. If your own full brother or your son or your daughter or your beloved wife or your intimate friend entices you secretly to serve other than God, whom you and your father haven't known, gods of any other nation near at hand or far away from one end of the earth to another do not yell at him or listen to him nor look with pity upon him to spare him or shield him but kill him your own hands should be first raised to slay him then the rest of the people shall join in with you <laughs> you shall stone him to death because he saw to lead you astray from your lord your god who brought you out of the land of egypt the place of slavery and all of Israel hearing of this shall fear never do such evil as this in your midst which passages of scripture should guide our public policy should we go with uh, Leviticus which uh, suggests slavery is okay or we could go uh, with uh, Deuteronomy which suggests stoning your child if he strays from the faith or should we just stick to the Sermon on the Mount? A passage that is so radical that it's doubtful that our own Defense Department would survive its application. Folks haven't been reading their Bible. Clarify that and 
we can certainly move on. And as far as, once again, the, the takia that uh, apostasy is an ancient idea, I mean, we were in Afghanistan, and Americans were outraged when uh, Abdul Rahman, was sentenced to death after we had liberated that country. And it was only after a week of intense lobbying by Western governments that he was um, given political asylum in Italy. So, I mean, let, let's, just, let's just stick to the facts. I bet you're so concerned, Mrs. Jewish lady. I'm pretty sure you're so concerned about the girl. And I'm pretty sure you love your Christian friend there, David Wood. You probably love him so much. All the Jews love him. All the Jews love their Christian brothers. That's how they raise their kids. You and your f***ing Jesus, you kiss the f***ing kid. No way. I break your camera, don't take picture. I bet you alone, no picture. We don't want picture. Please. You need to, you need to, you can't come in here. This is, a, this is a, not your house. She is the most reliable witness against the uh, the heinous nature, violent nature of Islamic law that we have we have seen since uh, since 9/11. Now, this is an anathema to us. We are Western thinking. We don't kill our children. And this is what we have to stop. We have to stop thinking in this Western state of mind, whether we understand it or not is irrelevant. And I find that uh, the, the, the influence of groups l like CARE and other Muslim organizations has become uh, so powerful. They, they're, 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 they've so overwhelmed uh, the media that now it seems like nothing is going, I mean, nothing is going to be done. What, what, it, what can we do? In other words, uh, people like you, people like us, whether uh, Christian or Jewish or, or atheist or uh, anyone who believes that this girl should be protected, what is, what is there for us to do? Uh, or Sikh or Hindu, exactly. Well, first of all, let me say that you're right. She has been sacrificed at the altar of political correctness, and what you see happening in Ohio now is they are really enforcing Sharia law. Into the show, Robert. Are you talking to me, Robert Spencer? Hey. Hey. <laughs> hey, how are you? Good. Good. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm happy to be here. What can I do for you? Uh, now, in the, in the West, we're used to people telling us the truth. If I walk up to, uh, to a Jewish rabbi or to a, a Christian minister and I ask a question about that person's religion, I'm used to that person telling me the truth about what his religion teaches. Now, uh, why is this different in Islam so, so that uh, when someone in the media goes down the street and asks an imam, hey, does your religion teach this, they get answers that are simply inconsistent with what, their, with what their religion actually teaches. So why is it so different when we ask a Muslim a question from when we ask a, a Christian or a Jew or even an, an atheist or, or a Hindu or a Sikh? Why is it so different? We have to understand that in Islam, according to the Quran, questioning is a bad thing. Uh, Muslims are actually told not to question their faith because they might lose their faith in the Quran. And so when a non-Muslim comes and questions Islam, comes and questions some aspect of Islamic teaching, this is considered to be a threat to Islam. And then another provision of Islamic teaching kicks in, and that is the teaching that if a Muslim is under pressure, if a Muslim is under threat, if he's being challenged or if he is in fear, then it is perfectly legitimate for him to deceive the unbelievers and pretend that he believes something else. And this also is founded in the Quran, that a Muslim can pretend to believe something that he does not believe when he's under pressure, when he is in fear for his life or in some sort of grave danger. And sometimes the questioning itself is interpreted as exactly that kind of grave danger. Oh, shut up. There was a companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him, getting killed, and both his parents were killed in front of him, so he had to lie about his faith and, and say that he's a disbeliever. And then he went to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and told him, and the Prophet, the verses came down for, from God and said that it's okay in that situation for a person to lie, not when they're preaching to people like some Christians do. 
Folks haven't been reading their Bible. Folks haven't been reading their Bible. 